Okay. Well, first of all, thank you, thank you very much for the Guild and Julie for allowing, for hosting um, this evening's webinar. And I say good morning to anyone that may be up early in Australia. Good afternoon to anyone from the US. And of course, good evening to those of you that are in the UK. Tonight, we're actually highlighting a, a really, really early one name study. And I've always found it fascinating um, because we, we as Guild members um, have all the steps to the one name study. I don't think these gentlemen would have heard that. They were just fascinated by their surname, which is Lydiard, which is a name that I was born with. Um, and they researched this from the very, very early days. Um, what is so wonderful about this is that they have records that don't even exist today. For example, the Somerset wheels. Um, they actually extracted and transcribed all of the wheels of Lydiard's of all spelling out of the Somerset um, archive office all those very many years ago. The reason that I chose this picture, it actually highlights the time span that this, this investigative um, work went through, which is um, William Bedford, 1840, he was born in 1849. Eka Stratton, his son, which is sitting there, he was born in 1878. And Fonda Alexander, who was born in 1917. As I said, the research was carried out, and not just in the name Lydiard, they actually looked at every single instance of the variants, which we know there's around 27. Um, over the years. They're known to the family and through their notes as WB or WBL, ESL and ARL. And if anyone has a look on um, our website, both the Guild website and the Lydiard Family History website, you'll see frequent re references to WBL, ESL and ARL. This research was done at a time where obviously there was no computers. It was actually done by traveling all over the UK and writing letters to all of the archive offers, which they have included in this, in this particular study. Now, where do they sit in? You can possibly see, of course, um, you've got William Bedford, his sister Rhoda, Edgar Stratton, and finally Alexander Rockley Lydiard. And yes, there's another, there is another generation um, below that. Now, how did this start? William Bedford actually retired from the civil service due to ill health. Um, and he was actually told um, that he probably wasn't going to live that long. So he actually made his research into the Lydiard family, his full-time job until the day that he passed away. He must have actually <laughs> spoke around this a lot at the dinner table to both his son and his grandson who actually followed in his footsteps uh, right up until the, the 1960s. The family for a start were very proud Lydiards because prior to um, WB, um, and I have seen this, this collection, they have kept a lot of the family Bibles and the portraits of that particular family. You've only got to look at the middle names um, of this particular generation of Lydiards, Stratton and Rockley, our middle names that relate directly to the history of our family. Rockley is, of course, um, well, after Rockley Manor, which is in North Wiltshire, just near Oldbourne St Andrew, not far from Marlborough. Um, the manor was an Elizabethan manor. Unfortunately, it was pulled down in the 70s and 80s. Um, that is reputedly built by the Lydiard family. We do have some photos of that manor um, just before it, before it was actually bulldozed. Now, Stratton was the maiden name of Jane Stratton, the sister of Lord Craven, who actually married into the Lydiard family. How did I locate this? Because it's certainly not in any public archives. One or two pages are, um, which I've seen one or two pages in the Society of Genealogy in, in the UK. However, I came, found this coming in from a different angle, is that when my one name study actually started the wine DNA project. It was two lines of Lydiard, one from two tiny villages, five miles apart. And I want 
assumed they were one and the same family, but I actually wanted to double check and prove it. Um, long story, but parish records were missing. We couldn't do it that way. So I actually did, I wanted to do a Y-DNA study. The problem was we get plenty of Lydiards from Auburn. I had to do all the research between the Ogbourne and Auburn lines and bring them down to the current day. Once I did that, I actually located um, a gentleman, Strat Lydiard, and actually wrote to him, probably 2011, 2012. And then I waited and waited, thought, I'm not gonna hear from him. It just so happened in 2013, which coincided with one of my trips to the UK, that I actually got an email from him saying, um, I believe you actually want to, want to talk to me. Um, and I do have some records of the Lydiard family. He actually told me the background of the um, one name study that he's, his, his ancestors had completed. Um, and since then, I met him and I have spent about 15 days over many trips to the UK, imaging over 10,000 images of boxes and boxes of writing, photos and research that have been carried out by these three individuals. Since then, I have been walking in their footsteps because every single reference of where they actually got this research is certainly catalogued in their papers. So it's very easy to walk in their footsteps. The collection of wheels um, is pretty amazing. What they've actually done is, now each one does their research a little differently. Obviously WB wrote everything down and in exercise books, what he did was in every single county, every single archive office, he's indexed every single will of the Lydiard name right back to the earliest times. Um, so Edgar Stratton actually commenced starting typing them out. Um, so he's actually transcribed a number of wills, both PCC wills and a number of wills from the Wilshire History Centre. Back then, um, the Wilshire Record Office. So I'm very lucky to have the transcripts all of those wills. Also to on the bottom of each will, they've actually drawn a little family tree um, of, of how the people on those wills, every single person that is mentioned in those wills um, and how it fits in um, to the Lydiard family. This is just an example of some of, 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 of actually how um, they've gone through and cataloged. This is the Litchfield wills. Um, of all the Lydia's and you can certainly see the different spellings um, back in those times, right back to 1563. Now every single county, um, they've actually done this um, and listed and indexed every single will from the family. Some of those wills, as I said now, it's not a, we're not able to um, locate these days due to various reasons. Not every not every will has been transcribed, but there's probably a good 50% of them. But we do know that, you know, originally there was a will. These are the wills of the Lydiards of Rockley, of which these three have descended from. Um, you can see that they've actually listed them. That particular record is not, not in the, the greatest of condition, but I've certainly, as I said, I've certainly got it imaged so that we have a record of what was written. As I said, he's gone through single every single village of Wiltshire and listed every single will, um, as is as are the Boer counties that they've found. Another note that I have, which is later done by ES or Agus Stratton, he's actually done a summary of every single will that he found. Started off. Um, with the person that passed away and every single person that was actually mentioned, who was the overseers um, of, of, of any trust, um, who were the witnesses, who he mentions in that will, and finally a little family tree so that we can easily picture who was mentioned and how they fit in.
amongst the collection also is about 76 letters that has been written to to all of the record officers um, and he's kept a copy of of their reply and his original that they, they've sent. Now I find this amazing that a complete collection that was done as I said from the 1880s right up into the 1960s certainly were any computers and they did not have the references of what we have today and to have such a complete picture of their family and other related families I just find it truly amazing given the time frame. And another category of their research is they've actually looked into the chancery records and litigation of Lydiards. There has always been um, rumours and family legends that the Lydiard house near Swindon in Wiltshire that we actually owned. Now apparently there was a court case um, of the of the Lydiards spelt L-Y-D-I-A-R-D who started calling their children uh, John the St John Lydiard um, to reference the fact that they were actually from, <laughs> should have owned the house because the family as you know in um, um, that had Lydiard House was, was the St. John family, which is actually Lord Beaucamp. Beaucamp. Um, we obviously lost that, but there's certainly a transcription um, of that piece of litigation and many other litigations that have happened since the 13 and 1400s. Here again, um, another, another Chancery Proceedings, handwritten this time um, from 1651. There's, there's probably of the litigation, I counted last night, there was over 900 images that I've actually taken of the transcripts of the litigation of the Lydiard families. Believe me, um, over, a few, over a few Poulton House and obviously, obviously um, of Winston Andrew, there's quite a few boxes in Wiltshire and the PRO relating to those court cases. Now parish records certainly don't look like um, what they what we're used to seeing now and there certainly wasn't ancestry around um, for these three. So they actually wrote to each church and actually got a copy of the parish records. Um, and you can see the little stamp there um, that they paid the duty on them to get those, um, which I found amazing. And it's, it's quite lovely to see um, how they used to issue them. This is another extract, um, which obviously going further back, um, again, from the, the church themselves, the bigger themselves, which lists um, the christening of Gilbert Lydiard. Another one, this time from St Dunstan in Stepney. Again, you can see that this is certified that it's a true extract. And I think it's amazing to see um, what, what we would have got had we been researching back then. Some of the other records that they have in there um, was just many, many letters of other Lydiards that they've actually written to over the years that have, that have actually told them their story um, and and given them many, many family trees. This one was um, actually one of my relatives. Uh, obviously, um, they actually wrote to the family and they've actually sent them their business card, which, I, which is lovely to have. Otherwise, I certainly would not have had it. One of the many objects that is part of the collection, which I've had the um, pleasure of seeing was the original family Bible held by this particular line. Uh, some of it dating as you can see from 1656 and it's actually handwritten by each member of the family going down. Again this one was um, this one was written um, in the very early 1800s by William B's father and you can see it lists every single event that's happened in the family who passed away. But it's actually the original life and it's amazing that it's still sitting, sitting in the same family. 
This one is a lovely page, which I think, because all three you know, of these individuals have added their notes to keep their continuation of the same family Bible. Um, you can see uh, William Bedford. Um, then we've got Edgar Stratton in the middle, his handwriting. And finally, Alexander Rockley Lydiard has added his notes on WB himself. Among the research also, um, there's over two and a half thousand images of the trees of the family, not only of their family, but Lydiards of all over the UK. You can see here, and I know that I spoke back in January about this line being invaluable to our research because it's a continuous line back to 1453 which has been proven by manorial records and wills and other and other research. Here we see the direct mail line and I said this is just one of many family trees um, that they have put together um, not only from them, but certainly from other Lydiards that they've actually kept as well. It's amazing to see them all in one place. Ev but all three of them have also, in that particular collection, have summarised their findings up to date in a particular time. This particular one was done in the 1950s and 1960s by Alexander Rockley Lydiard. Um, it's quite amusing to see um, that he doesn't always agree with WB and doesn't always agree with ES, um, as I'm sure we don't agree with um, other people's research on certain lines as well. Um, and he does, all three of them offer another alternative to certain lines. Um, how many images take after their research findings? Well, Alexander's is a whole folder full through of this particular one. Um, ES is probably about 100 pages. WB takes up a whole exercise book of his findings on the research um, of particular lines of the family. And of course, back then, as I'm sure some guild members have actually started off, each and every one um, of these individuals have an index card of which I've imaged every single one. Um, and on that, sometimes there can be two or three cards for the one individual. They have written down every single thing they've actually located on that particular image. And what I really like about it as well, it's not just the male lines that they've actually researched, as you can see, which is why I've chosen this particular index card to show you, is they've actually also listed um, all the female lines and their maiden names as well, which of course is invaluable to our research as well, because they're just as important as the male line. In the not in the actual collection, but I'm very, very privileged to see there's portraits running um, right, and it's still held by the family right back to 1782 of a generation of the family. This happens to be John William Lydiard, um, son of Thomas Lydiard, who was a silversmith in London. Um, John William, this was painted around 1782. He was born in the late 1770s. It is amazing to see that they're all together in one collection of this family. So what we've tried to do is showcase much less than 1% of this collection. This is invaluable to the Lydiard and a variant one name study and also the Lydiard Family History Society. I'm very lucky to, to have hold and imaged 85% of the collection. This has allowed me over the years to actually follow in their footsteps. Do I agree with all their findings? In the benefit of hindsight, which we have now and the availability of the many more records that we have now. No, I don't always agree, but it's also, amazing to see side by side and we certainly wouldn't be as advanced as what we are without this amazing connect, um, 
collection of family data that I have had the amazing chance to see from 2013. What we plan to do um, is to transcribe and publish this collection. Um, we're going to uh, put the many photographs and the many letters um, and we're actually going to probably do e-publishing um, so that it is available and we can actually send it to libraries such as Society of Genealogy and the Family History Library in Utah. I would like to thank Stratton Lydiard for allowing me continued access to this wonderful collection. Um, only a letter a couple of days ago, sorry, probably a couple of weeks ago now, time has gone fast this year. Um, I noticed that WB was writing um, uh, in regards to somebody that was living in Rockley in North Wiltshire, which I previously mentioned was the home of the manor um, of the Lydiards from Elizabethan times. Um, this letter was written in 1906 and it mentions that they've actually stapled a photo of, of the Rockley Manor. Now we've only got um, photos of the manor just before that it was actually being pulled down in the 1780s. And even though it was being pulled down then, there is no trace of that manor now and there's no one left to tell us exactly where on that property um, it actually sat. We believe we know, um, but next time I'm in the UK and next time Strats happens to be in the UK, um, we're going to try and find that record so we can actually resolve that issue once and for all. So it's it's still relevant up until today, um, the, the many pieces of this collection. Now for those, Lydi those in the Lydiard family, what we have coming up as well, is in July, we're actually going to be talking about the uh, Lydiards and Litigation Part 1. It's such a big topic um, of the two massive court cases. Um, this particular one went on for over 150 years. Now, Poulton House has been called many of the, the most complete Georgian house in the UK. It's actually, uh, we wouldn't call it a manor house because it's not that big. And the reason it's so, so complete on the outside is the court case um, of the members of the Lydiard family from about 1730 right through up to about 1877 when it was finally resolved. Um, nothing was actually touched. It is as it is on the outside and that's why it's a grade two listed house, which I have, have had the pleasure of having a look at. So we'll talk about the court case and why it actually came about. The second part um, that we're actually doing in October of 2023 is we're actually going to talk about the last Lydia's Brockley and the court case over the church chancel um, and the many, many bankrupts um, of that particular line of the family. Now, finally, um, we're very pleased to announce that those may have heard that we are going to be doing a real live gathering in Wiltshire on the 21st of September 2024 followed by our very first gathering in Salt Lake City in the US on the 28th of September 2024, um, which I'm really excited to be about that one. Um, that's been many, many years in coming. That's actually going to be held at the Family History Centre, which has kindly um, allowed us access in, um, of one of their rooms in the Family History Centre there in Salt Lake. So I look forward to seeing a few Lydiards there. Finally, I'd like to thank you, again, thank you to Strat Lydiard for allowing us access into that amazing collection. I will let um, the society know when we have our first copy of uh, publishing some of those memoirs of that particular family. And also in the next couple of weeks, we have about a hundred pages already transcribed and I'll be putting that up both on the Guild Lydiard website and to the Lydiard Family History Society as well. So thank you very much, and I've hoped you've enjoyed a little taste inside this amazing collection.
Is there any questions at all? Which I can't see, obviously, Julie's going to have to tell me. Julie, can you see if there's any questions at all? Sorry, I've muted myself. Um, there's no questions <laughs> currently. I'm always doing that, as you know. Okay. Uh, there's no questions currently, apart from the ones I have on my index card. Um, is there an index of the beneficiaries to the wills? Yes, the there is. Yards. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, there is. I'm trying and to that, work out the best way of actually pu pu publishing those index cards rather than photographing every single one. Um, that is up on my brain. I'm sure I'll find a solution at some stage, but rather than um, just putting the many, many thousands, um, which is probably not going to, it's going to take up far too much space. I'm trying to think of the best way of actually publishing the information on those index cards. Yeah. Um, from a one name perspective it's kind of fascinating to see that there is this um if you like concentration of lydiards in one particular area but then equally there is this huge concentration of material that has spanned what is it 100 years 150 years something like that um I yeah, think most yeah. of us can only dream of having access to something like that. So I think it's excellent. The other question I've got. I, I remember is, the first. Yeah, go on, carry on, Karen. I was just going to say, I remember the first time um, Strat said to me, um, oh, yes, I've got a few papers on the Lydiard family. <laughs> and then he started pulling the boxes out of the attic. And I, my mouth dropped. My mouth just dropped. And I think I just went, oh, wow. And he just laughed at me because that expression just kept coming out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah, I can, yeah, I, I can Im imagine because it's, I think we can all just dream about having something for our own family, perhaps, or something that links into our study. Um, and it is just such a huge concentration of material. And the fact, but I, I love the, the the personal bit to it, the the handwriting, the little trees. Um, you know, I'm very, as you know, I'm very analog, so I never do anything without having a pen yeah. or a pencil. And so for me, it's I, I just I just love that. I think it's a it adds a different dimension to the work that we do as genealogists, and as and plus to the work we do as people that have a study that perhaps works with a surname that maybe we have, we share, share that surname with absolute strangers. Um, and and mm, how exactly. many strangers will vary depending on the kind of the name. How far exactly. down the line did they take the female line? Did they just go one or two generations? Did they carry on going? What have um, they they've, they've, they've taken it down. They took it down one generation. So you'll have... Um, Depending on the family, because we married into the, in the very early days, um, and obviously the villagers, um, we were middle class landed gentry. So there was only a few, well, that particular line was, my line was masons and then agricultural labourers. <laughs> but um, um, if we married into this, uh, the Seymour family, um, probably not of Wolf House, no, yeah. um, the Goddards. So um, those particular families, um, probably five, six generations because we married in, in and out of those particular family. Um, for the, once we moved out of Wilshire, or, or particular lines moved out of Wilshire, they actually took it down two generations. Okay, okay. Uh, I think it, it is fascinating. Are, are there any, I mean, there, obviously there's a few, photographs that you've got here because you've shown us a few but how yep. many more photographs are within the society's archive um i've just started uploading some of them we've got about 35 up there i've just had to clean them up um they have been the, the collection has been sitting in an attic 
Um, so we've actually got to do a bit of a clean up. Um, I have on my Dropbox file over 10,500 images of this whole collection. Wow. Yeah, that is. Um, so, and yeah, so it's going to, it, like these three gentlemen, it's going to be my life's work to actually get it transcribed um, and actually getting it to some sort of condition that we can actually um, publish it um, electronically. Also, um, preserve uh, what we've got. Some of it, um, we're, um, as you can see, it, it's over a hundred years old, um, some of the paper. So it needs to be transcribed in a, in a source that, that people can share it. Um, my thoughts are at the moment, once we've done that, we can um, copy electronically to the Guild, copy to the Society of Australian, sorry, uh, Genealogy in London, um, Wilshire History Centre and Salt Lake City um, because uh, many descendants are in Salt Lake and the US as well. Okay, so I think this is a, it's been a great collection to be able to kind of take the lid off the box and just see what's in there and I think this is, I mean I don't have any Lydiard collections, in fact I only have one Lydiard butcher marriage in the whole of my study, um, so I think this has been a fascinating um, a fascinating talk around such a phenomenal collection. So I think it's just amazing. Um, I think it's been great. So thank you for sharing it with us, Karen. And I just want to say to people that are doing one name study, um, not all records are in archive offices. It was only that I, and I'm not afraid of hearing the word no, <laughs> um, um, I wrote to people um, and I was actually asked after uh, Strat's DNA because we wanted to prove the link. Um, and that's how you just fell upon it. So letters sometimes work and you don't know what you're going to find around that corner. And do you connect to his line at all? Uh, yes, we do, but we yet to find that connection. Um, the all born Lydiards, which is what I'm uh, where I descend from, and the Ogbourne St Andrew line, which is where Strat comes from, share an ancestor. But um, I think I mentioned in my January thing, the parish records are missing. Um, of course are. We know that happened in the 1600s. Yeah, we know that happened in the early 1600s. Um, we're yet to find that piece of um, vital link and I'm determined that I'm going to un <laughs> look under every rock until we find a clue to see what where we actually link up both lines. Okay. Um, there's been no other questions, so I think you might want to wrap up, but I think this has been an excellent um, illustration in terms of just how you can, you can channel your study into such a huge, and tap into this huge volume of, of, of material. Um, and it just goes to show, and in fact, it actually reminds me in some ways of the webinar that we did, um, might have been February actually, with Julian Pooley, from, sorry, History Centre, where he did something very, very similar. But what he said was one family, and it was the Nichols family. Um, and again, it was about accessing material that was with the family, um, or in fact, with a, a number of elements to the family. And then all these institutions that had slithers um, and even bringing able to access all those bits to create this index, um, illustrating everything that was available. Uh, so this in some ways reminds me of that because there is just this huge volume of material that's available. Um, and we all hope that we have a uh, of, of, we have access to something like this and probably could only ever dream of that. So thank you, Karen, for sharing that with us. It's been really, really fascinating. And thank you. And, and, and thank you very much for hosting this. You're very welcome. And I dare say that we will probably host, well, I, I have no problem in hosting the next two. So I think that would be absolutely fascinating. And I get to hear a little bit about, um, about the Lydiards and, and why not? So thank you so much, Karen. So the recording will be available for people who want to perhaps come back and explore the Lydiard um, 
record for this recording and the other recording and um, the post will be available of when the recording is available and there will be a link to the January webinar that we did with between Karen and I um, just having a quick there's just one question that's just popped in um, actually um, Susan has just said, um, are you aware that Thomas Lydiard, the silversmith, overstamped a lot of Hester Bateman's work? Yes, I am. Um, and I'm not, I've actually just bought um, a, a coffee tray from an auction in the UK, which I'm about to send off to a friend in England. I can pick it up next time. Yes, I certainly was. Not all. I've actually got a silver spoon here of Thomas Lydiard. Um, but yes, I would like to explore that further of why it was overstamped. <laughs> um, just out of interest, whilst you were talking, in fact, um, I just went to a fairly well-known auction site and I should have a disclaimer here. I take no responsibility for anything you may buy following what I'm about to say. Um, I have, for my own studies, I have a um, an alert that pops up, you know, every time um, anything's listed for but the surname Butcher or Orlando. Now, you know, I have to trail through quite a lot of stuff involving holidays, Butcher Blocks, you name it. But every now and again, you get quite a gem. And there is a few gems on that auction site, including a teapot from presumably the same Thomas Lydiard um, that Susan was referencing. Um, so as far as, said, we were, as far as we were aware, the only silversmith in the family, as far as we're aware. Okay, so this is, um, I take no responsibility should you purchase this, um, but, but if you do purchase it, you might like to tell your husband I said I'm really sorry, but there was there was a few bits and pieces on there, um, I, I couldn't resist it, and uh, you know, at best you could hope for a postcard, maybe a picture, um, however, a Georgian crested silver teapot from 1816, I'm sure would look lovely in your display unit, should you have one. <laughs> yes, that'll be go with the um the the the, the silver uh, the silver coffee tray which I've just purchased which I haven't told him yet. <laughs> uh, well, I I wouldn't want to 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 spoil your husband's surprise. Um, so thank you so much. Karen. <laughs> it's been a fascinating talk. Um, and we will be back with the next Guild webinar, which is I think just before Easter, and it's with Diane Aitchinson who is spotlighting on her. Uh, Lydia, uh, her Aitchinson surname study. So we will look forward to seeing everyone then and this recording will be up at some point in the next couple of days. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye bye everyone.